Mm -hmm. Are we um, are going on? Yep, we're live. Can I hit record? The mic. We're live now, so when you're ready. Okay. All right. Um, good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the meeting of the North Carolina Marine Fish Commission Shellfish and Crustacean Advisory Committee uh, to order. Um, I am actually co chair Mike Blanton. The other co chair with me here is going to be Anna Shellum. I'm going to lead the meeting. Um, this time, I think we're going to do a rotational type of thing. Um, before the meeting gets underway, I'm going to read one um, item here, and that is uh, North Carolina General Statute 138A 15E, and that mandates that at the beginning of any meeting of a board, the chair shall remind all members of their duty to avoid conflicts of interest under Chapter 138. The chair shall also inquire as whether there is any known conflict of interest with respect to any matters coming before the board at the time. Any of the committee members have any? Okay, moving on. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to go around the room. Um, do a, just a small introduction. I know I've already done that. Um, I'll start right here. Good. Right. Just state your name and, and go on about. It. <laughs> My name is uh, Mike Marshall. I worked for the division for about 40 years, been retired eight. Worked with shellfish almost all of my career. I was there, and I'm a recreational shell fisherman now. I live right here in uh, Forehead City, a couple of blocks to the south. <laughs> this is me, uh, Bruce Morris. Our Coast Guard. I've been with the committee maybe eight or nine years. Worked fish on and off all my life, and I come up to work at a lake manager for 11 stores. My name is Sue Hammond. This is my first meeting, and I'm glad to be here. I hope it's a good time to work with you all. I uh, have lived in Moorhead City now. For just about three years, all of my family is from here, and I live on the Newport River, just a few miles from here. I'm a remote worker for the National Institutes of Health, where I'm a health scientist. So I have a lot of experience in uh, science and technology, and I, I'm very interested in shellfish farming. My name is Ted Logus. Um, I live in Hampstead, in Pender County. Uh, I work for the North Carolina Coastal Federation. Environmental nonprofit. I've worked with them 25 years, I think. Um, spent a lot of time working with folks like, like Mike and other the division over the years, kind of learning from them, and then been lucky enough to spend some time uh, with some commercial fisher folks out in the water, learning about oystering how it comes down, New River, and things like that. So I went up. Trying to get my degree, who were trying to write my thesis for a master, all about oysters. So, got yeah, a little bit of field knowledge, a little bit of um, people knowledge, and I do a lot of oyster restoration projects. So, I did a lot of um, we work on grants and put those things the implementation as well as the oyster blueprint, uh, kind of jack of all trades, master of none. I'm Anna Shellum and I'm a new commissioner. Um, I own a company called Shellum Seafood and I do nothing but wild harvest shellfish in particular. So I'm really happy to be here and be a part of your discussions. Um, I'm Laura Klebanski and I uh, am the Marine Fishery Commission liaison. So I work with the commissioners and also um, with all of the ACs um, and with the staff leads who are um, invaluable as well as the admins. Um, these are my favorite people. <laughs> so, um, and I'm I'm very happy that we can be in person and have this opportunity to see each other again. So, I'm Debbie Manley, and I'm the admin for fisheries management. I'm Hoot Wade, and I'm the admin to the director. I am Corinne Flora. I am the fisheries management plan coordinator for the division. Peter. Uh, 
And I'm Mike Blanton, Marine Fisheries Commissioner, um, commercial fisherman, mainly blue crabs, um, but a little bit of everything, uh, some fed fish. And um, that's about it. And we'll have uh, Brian Shepard, Doug Cross, and Tim Willis online, and maybe they'll be able to speak up where we can hear. Uh, my name is Doug Cross. I am a member of the Marine Fisheries Commission. I am the vice chair. I am co-chair of this committee behind the, I'm the, I don't know what I am in this committee, vice chair or something, but uh, I own uh, Pamlico Packing Company. Uh, have been around shrimp oysters and crab for over 40 years now have processed them all uh have been uh to various places all over the world and looked at stuff process so uh, i've got a pretty good uh depth of knowledge when it comes to uh crustacean thank you um i can go tim willis i'm, I'm actually a ceo of a biotech company we're developing a drug for an ophthalmology uh, but I grew up in Beaufort and have been involved with fisheries uh, all my life. A friend of mine who is a uh, who is in actually an angler for crabbing, and then another guy who's a shrimper said, "You need to do this, Tim, because you bring logic and science <laughs> and ask a lot of tough questions." So that's why I'm here, and I want to make sure that the environment is there for my great 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 grandkids so that's why i'm all involved and i also have a place in marshallburg down on the coast what well, mr shepherd <clears throat> no but he did say he was driving so he may not be that's able fine. to that's fine um, and then we can have Andy say a few words. Yeah, hi, I'm Ann Deaton um, with Division of Marine Fisheries in the Habitat and Enhancement Program. And I'm helping Tina out tonight. Thank you. Okay, um, so the first order of business we're gonna have is approval of the agenda. I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve the agenda. Mr. Marshall. Second. 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 Okay, the second order of business we're going to have here is the approval of the minutes from our October 9th, 2021 meeting. I'll entertain a motion to that if there's any no changes. Motion to approve. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Pass Okay, next we're going to have um, Laura Koblanski. She's going to give us an update <laughs> on free fish. All right. Welcome in. Get comfortable. <laughs> um, so, you guys actually have not met um, since October of 2021. Um, so, it's been a while. And we have new people. Um, we have new AC members and also new commissioners um, who are now um, on this committee. So I am going to go back. Uh, I'm not going to do a full review of the <laughs> annual calendar of everything that's happened, but I do want to um, give you a couple of updates. And then I'm going to start with the chip update because that's the last item that you guys have discussed at this table. Um, so one thing I want to point out is that we are streaming live on YouTube um, and these microphones are quite sensitive. So you have a hot mic right in front of you. So just keep that in mind um, as we're going through the meeting. Um, and um, 
for the um, new commissioners, like I said, we have new commissioners. Um, we have Anna Shellum. Um, she now holds a commercial seat that was previously held by Sam Romano, um, who served on this committee. Uh, we also have Doug Rader. He filled the scientist seat that was vacated when um, Pete Cornegie resigned. Um, he resigned for personal reasons. And so um, uh, Commissioner Rader will be filling the remainder of his um, term. Uh, we also have Donald Huggins, who was sworn in as an at-large member, um, and he fills a seat that was vacated by Tom Hendrickson. Um, and finally, at the FinFish meeting last week, we swore in our last new commissioner, who is Sarah Gardner, and she um, fills uh, the other at-large seat who was held by, or that was held by Martin Posey previously. Um, so those are our new commissioners. So at the November meeting, we will have our full complement of commissioners. Um, in, in August, we had, uh, we were one short. Uh, Commissioner Gardner was out of town um, for that meeting. So um, the other item I want to talk about is we are currently in the advisory committee solicitation period. So we are accepting applications for all um, five advisory committees. We also will be reaching out to currently serving members whose terms will be up in 2020 uh, at the end of this year. So if your term is up at the end of this year, we will contact you and ask you if you would like to continue to serve. Um, and we will ask that you send in an application. If you know that you wanna continue and that your term's up already, you can go ahead and do that. Um, it's, the applications are online on the website. And if you cannot find them, you can just call me or Hope or Debbie or Corinne or Tina, um, and we will get it for you. Um, so just let us know. But again, we will reach out um, to everyone. Um, so moving into the MFC items, um, I do want to give you an update on the chip. As I said, that was the last item that you reviewed. Um, so the uh, I will say this. We have Ann Deaton here um, who knows all things chip. She is the master of the chip as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so if you have specific questions about the chip, she can um, answer those for you. I'm just going to basically give you what happened. So. Um, this committee recommended that the chip be approved, um, and it was in fact approved by all three commissions. Um, all three commissions recommended um, the development of a public-private partnership to help um, with um, various aspects of um, research and fundraising and things like that to help implement chip actions. So, um, so it was. It did move forward, and there have been a number of meetings and activities going on implementing the chip actions recently. Um, we have, uh, and again, Anne can give you more of an overview if you have specific questions about it. But that was, um, it, it is underway implementation of that plan. So, does anybody have any questions that they want to ask um, Anne right now for that one? Nope. Okay. Um, so. <clears throat> the other items um, are mostly from the May commission meeting and then again from the August commission meeting. Um, I'm going to start with river herring um, and these I'm just going to run through the action items. Corinne Flora is going to give you more of the details of the various FMPs. Um, so just uh, remember if you're looking for more detail, Corinne will follow that. Um, so at the, <clears throat> at the May meeting, or was it August? It was August. I apologize. At the August meeting, <laughs> um, the commission approved the River Herring FMP as an information update. Um, there were no changes. Uh, that basically means that there are no changes at this time. Um, and the um, reason that we went that direction was because um, currently the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission um, is uh, undertaking a stock assessment. So that is underway and we're going to wait to make any changes based on the outcome of that assessment. So for Southern Flounder, um, the commission gave final approval on the Southern Flounder FMP Amendment 3 in May. Um, and Corinne will go uh, into the implementation of that management, but probably um, a lot of you have heard about the flounder seasons that occurred this fall. So um, Corinne will talk more about that specifics. Um, so Stripe Mullet, during the May meeting, the commission were presented with the stock assessment report for Stripe Mullet. Um, the next step uh, was the scoping, which was held and is now closed. Um, and at the 
November meeting, um, the commission will hear um, about the outcome of that scoping period, and they will also be presented with the goal and objectives um, for the FMP. So basically, um, we're at the beginning of that um, sort of commission process of the FMP development. Um, for striped bass, um, the commission selected their preferred management measures for the striped bass fishery management plan amendment two. Um, that was back in May. Um, so as you're aware, um, or, or maybe not, depending on how much you follow it, um, some of the other, uh, the regional committees um, did review this plan um, as part of the process. But the Gilna issue um, in the CSMA has dominated a lot of the conversation surrounding this plan. Um, and um, just given that, um, given that we had four, well, three new commissioners and then a fourth coming on, um, the commission decided to table that, um, any action on that plan until their November meeting. Um, and that's just to allow more conversation, to allow the new commissioners to get caught up before they make a final decision on that plan. So in November, um, the commission will um, take that up, take that issue up again, and they will be discussing Amendment 2 to the Strike Bass FMP. Um, and in addition to, you know, the Gilna items and the CSMA, there are um, a number of management items in that plan that address Albemarle Roanoke Sound um, stock, the, um, the Cape Fear, um, and then also the CSMA generally. <clears throat> so um, for spotted sea trout, um, the stock assessment presentation um, was uh, recently went through the peer review, and the commission will hear about that stock assessment. So they'll get the presentation for that in November. Um, and let's see, there were a number of other items um, that the that sort of came out of discussions at the commission table. Um, in May, the commission received a presentation on blue catfish. This is something that um, a number of the commissioners have brought up. We've heard it from the public, and we also in the division have been working on um, blue catfish, uh, which is an invasive species in the Albemarle Sound, um, and it's becoming more of an issue. Um, so the uh, commission received the blue catfish update in May, um, and based on conversation at the table, um, the division is continuing to work towards bringing something back to the commission for more discussion. Um, in, in terms of what that might be, we don't know what that will look like yet. Um, we basically are at this point um, looking to collect more data um, and try to determine impacts of that um, fish. Um, the commission also requested that the division draft a letter to the South Atlantic Council um, addressing um, a dolphin issue. So there was um, a recently uh, the dolphin amendment passed with um, a slight reduction in the bag limit. And um, there has been continued discussion about further reductions. And basically, the commission requested that the division oppose um, further changes to that fishery. Uh, and the director agreed. Um, and the division will be uh, drafting that letter, and it will be going to the South Atlantic Council at their December meeting. Um, and um, the last issue was in, at, in November, or excuse me, in um, August, the um, commission, uh, actually Commissioner um, uh, Roller brought up the 2017 white paper on false albacore. Um, or rather, he brought up false albacore, and we brought up the 2017 issue paper that we had already drafted. Um, so the commission requested that that document be updated um, with more current data and also um, included discussion that might frame potential management options um, for the future in North Carolina. That is a highly migratory species, um, and we, it, Discussions are already occurring at the South Atlantic Council um, and at other councils for that species. But um, the this, this specific request at the commission meeting was regarding management that could be undertaken by North Carolina. So that's, um, at this point, it's more exploratory um, regarding what that might be. Um, and um, just as a reminder, the November meeting is scheduled for uh, November 16th through the 18th. And it's going to be held at the Islander Hotel in Emerald Isle, um, if any of you would like to join. Um, 
I know two of you, three of you will be there. <laughs> um, and with that, that concludes my update. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions if there's anything. Is there any update on the lawsuit that CCA is doing? Um, I do not have any update on that. Um, that is something that uh, I can't speak about um, more than to say it's ongoing. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. All right, because that has a major impact on several of those things you just mentioned, depending on how that the outcome of all that. Okay. All right. And the other question I had is: there been an update on the um, biomass of of crabs? I know we did it a couple of years ago. Is there a current one that's being close to being done? Let's slow you down just for a second. I think we're going to get to that here just shortly. Um, okay. So I'll wait. that question right. will be answered here in just a okay. Good. A while. All right. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, no further questions. Okay. I think we can move on. Uh, next. Still me. <laughs> Laura again. So we're going to talk about the uh, AC meetings planning overview. Yes. For 2023. So um, in front of you, you should have the 2023 meeting um, calendar. So this is the annual Marine Fishery Commission calendar. We put it together in the MFC office every year about this time. Um, and basically, we set the MFC business meeting schedule, and they occur mostly at the same time every year, um, generally. And then we have to set the contracts for those event spaces and things like that. Um, at the same time, we put together the advisory committee meetings. And in the past, um, or in the more recent past, what's happened is typically the ACs um, don't meet until there's actually an issue that's sent to you by the Marine Fisheries Commission. So what we are proposing um, is to have you meet um, four times a year um, to discuss issues um, that you may have and just to get updates. Um, and it's also an opportunity for us to talk about um, issues that may be coming up that you might be um, asked to review um, and also an opportunity um, for us to provide you with educational items. Um, for example, in January, we're planning to provide you with a presentation from one of our stock assessment scientists. Um, to review sort of what goes into these stock assessment scientists or stock assessments um, and to just give you an opportunity to ask questions of those people um, who are very technically, um, highly technical. Um, and, and it's just a nice opportunity for you to have, you know, access to them. So, <clears throat> so with that, um, I'm, I'm actually interested in hearing if the committee members are uh, would like to meet if you think that's a good idea um, and just generally your thoughts on um, hybrid meetings, in-person meetings. Um, our sort of tentative plan after this would be to set up uh, alternating virtual and in-person meetings. So January we'll have new advisory committee members um, potentially and so we would have a virtual meeting that would be basically an orientation and also an opportunity to hear that stock assessment uh, presentation. Then um, in April, we would have an in-person meeting. Again, that would be an update from the February commission meeting. And then um, in July, we'd be virtual again. And then October, you'd be meeting in person. So that's sort of the rough plan we won't solidify that until all of these meetings are completed and we get feedback from you committee members. Um, but that's that's sort of our plan. So uh, looking for feedback at this point. Yeah, I'm go ahead. Mike Marshall. Um, I haven't been a staff member to the committee that did serving on the committee. I think that's an excellent idea. Continuity, keeping in touch. 
almost impossible to meet, especially for someone like me. I'm not involved in commercial fishery. Um, I could go online and look for proclamations, but I don't do it a lot because I'm not involved. So for me in particular, it's a great idea. And like I said, being a staff person, keeping up with your, your committee members and being in touch with them and interacting with them is also highly important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, I have Sue Hammond. And again, this is my first meeting. So uh, I just have a couple of questions. Is it the expectation that we would also attend the MFC business meeting? You can attend them. You are not required to attend them. Um, it is not typically attended by advisory committee members. So it's no, not typically. Not typically. However, um, there's no reason that you can't. Um, okay. And they are also um, always online. So we may actually have members who listen online but don't actually attend them. Okay. If they give us some assignment, what's the length of time we have to turn it around? I I'm wondering why we're not following their meetings a little more closely. Um, because the outcome of your meetings typically goes to their meetings. So they need your input before they can make their next decision. Uh, how long do we have to turn something around if they ask us to do something? So depending on the item, typically you will have from that meeting time until their next meeting. So it's approximately three months. Um, however, we, um, that meeting time, when you meet, that's the point at which that decision making will be made. So in April, the decisions for this meeting, for this committee will be made for that main meeting. So we might meet in between. We between meet the- Right after the MFC meets. If there's an assignment for us, we might work on that for our official meeting. Um, typically, no. And it is something, if you request it, um, certainly we can we can put together a meeting. Um, but typically what happens, because all of our processes are pretty standard, um, we don't need that extra time. Yeah. Okay. And um, in the past, what's happened is that this group will meet like once a year. And what we've heard from AC members um, is that's not enough. And when 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 a decision comes to the table that's really controversial, there's no relationship that you've built on to sit down and have really difficult discussions. So what we're hoping is with these just having the four meetings a year, um, typically um, that will hopefully be enough to keep you informed of the various processes because they are pretty um, they're so based they're so standardized on the MFC business meeting schedule. Um, that hopefully that should be enough to keep you updated. However, if the committee decides that they need to meet again, that's certainly something you could request. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other feedback from Laura? Anybody on the line? Okay. All right. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. um, next, we're going to have some FMP plan updates uh, by Ms. Corinne Flora. Give her the floor. Um, so I'm going to update on um, our fisheries management plan items. Um, the, the new people, we refer to those as FMPs all the time. So that makes my life a lot easier on shortening the words come out of my mouth. <laughs> um, so um, we do have staff available um, if there are questions um, beyond my scope. Um, I'm going to start with flounder um, since I know people would like an update. So amendment three was adopted by the Marine Fisheries Commission in May and the division has implemented management the 2022 season was based on Amendment 3 management. The recreational season opened with a one fish bag limit for the month of September. Uh, we will not have full estimates of the recreational season until the MRIP wave is re released. 
usually that occurs um, at the end of November. So um, we'll know more um, for all of you in 2023 on that one. Um, the commercial season began on September 15th. Um, there were many DMF staff involved in this entire process. Our fisheries management staff, license and statistics, protected resources, uh, um, Green Patrol, that's only the name of a few. Um, it really was a group effort. We learned a lot during the 2022 season. It will be a few months before all of the data is available to tell the whole story of how the season went. Um, but our staff continues to have weekly meetings about it. And we have heard a lot of positive comments from stakeholders on size and availability of fish. Um, and our surveys have also showed some positive um, things as well in the preliminary look at them. Uh, so we look forward to having data and looking further at this fishery um, in the future. So before I move on, any questions that I might be able to answer about flounder? Ted, well, it's just after the recreational season, you got the acronym like MRIP? MRIP. So MRIP is the Marine Recreational, oh boy. Okay, so basically, Basically, it is the group that does the coastal survey of um, recreational fishing on the East Coast. Um, it is a federal program, and North Carolina actually is um, one of the largest contributors also to um, additional information that goes into MRIP. Um, we have our own pro clerks and everything that do that. So that's basically the people who interview the recreational people when they come back to the dock to get the like what they caught for the day, what they were looking for. Um, so that's the information that we use on recreational harvest um, to do our estimates of um, catch and discards for the year. And it's the um, Marine Recreational Information Program. I thought it was information program, but <laughs> <laughs> well, and I will say this: anybody who's interested in learning more about that program, NOAA has some really fantastic um, outreach materials. So if you just Google um, NOAA MRIP, then um, you can actually get access to a lot of their, um, the details about how those are done. Mm -hmm. And they have, um, what, what I said was they are, we'll have to wait for their wave to be done. So what they, they do um, groups, of packages of data. So every couple of months, they get the QAQ say their data, and then they put it out in one bulk data dump. Um, so we wait for them to do all of their calculations, put their data on, and then it's available to all the users. Sue, did you have a question? Yes, I think that there was some discussion when you were about this, that um, the, the captains of charter boats could lose a lot of income. Are there some economic indicators that we'll be seeing when you give us all the data in November? Um, so that is a, a data gap that we have um, when it comes to charter. Um, the whole charter fleet in general is a, a data gap that we have acknowledged. Um, unfortunately, there is um, legislation that we we cannot require them to do a logbook and some other things. So um, if that's a hard thing for us to tease out is the economic impact on that user group because we just see it as recreational harvest. Um, that is the only way it comes into us is recreational harvest. Um, so that is something that we have acknowledged in our plan and like research recommendations and things. However, it's not something we have immediately available to us. So we'll have a lot of data about what was caught and if people were satisfied with that, but we won't have data about people who weren't able to go out or who were very dissatisfied. We will have recreational landings and discards and we'll have commercial landings and discards. That's right. But this MRAP has additional data. Um, so MRAP is the recreational data. It, it, and if you the, have 
and well, sorry, go ahead. We do have um, we do have some economic data, but we can't tease out the for hire specifically from the general recreational category. Okay. Um, so we will see. Uh, we can over time look at the impacts generally um, economically, but we don't have the type of data to really drill down into that or specifically. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Carter, did you come forward to <laughs> lend us your expertise? Imret, Imret does have. I'm Carter <coughs> Sorry, I'm Carter Witt, and I'm the Colonel for the Marine Patrol here. Imret does have a sample section that does charter headboats and will tease out information of. What comes out of a charter headbed? Um, they have a they have a on dock survey, they have a call in survey, and they have a bail in survey. Said it's all done through NREP. The division right now has a grant through uh, that is put in for a grant our LNS section to do an economic survey or economic study on the charter headboat fleet to get a better idea of what actually um, is produced out of the charter headboat fleet. Um, that is being run. I don't know if LNS for our license statistics department. They're going to start trying to do that um, later in the year. Um, we might not, but um, we have the last study was done, I think, 10 years ago, if my memory correct, correct um, the last economic survey done for the charter head. Okay. But they are, um, we have a, an economist on, on our staff that is doing um, that got a grant and is doing this um, this work. Okay. And I will see that. Um, I, I'm pretty sure you can see that I am, once it's done. Yeah, and I can, um, we actually have a flyer out, so I can email that around. Um, Thank you, Carter. I wasn't sure where things well, were with licenses and statistics on that one. It's been a while yet, and there's also one that's ongoing with Sea Grant, and they're going to put together Reduced expectation as well, but we just found out about the secret. Okay. So staff are in discussions with the staff, so we can see the intensity of, of the sampling. Is your sense of it that the season went well and people weren't really mad? So people I are always mad at us. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> We've done quite a bit of outreach, and when we have uh, spoken to anglers, people are frustrated, um, generally, uh, but what we have heard, and this is all in total, is that people are seeing more fish and bigger fish, and so, uh, you know, there is at least uh, some discussion in the community about, okay, well, we are seeing bigger fish and more fish than we did. Um, and now we really want to catch them. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know that that dissatisfaction is going to wane and get to the point where we talk about expanding the fisheries. But generally, we have heard, you know, an again, anecdotally yeah. good things. Yeah, for Korea, for Okay, um, so now I'm going to move forward to our 2022 to 2027 FMP schedule. The commission was presented the draft schedule at its August meeting. This is a schedule that we um, present to them every August at um, their business meeting and the DEQ secretary approved the schedule. Um, the schedule coincides with us updating our um, FMP annual review book. Um, this updates all of our fisheries management plans that we have in the state, both um, state plans and, <clears throat> excuse me, federal plans. And so the 2022 and 2023 schedule uh, for review includes uh, river herring, hard clam and oyster, estuarine striped bass, spotted sea trout and striped mullet. Additionally, in 2023, the division plans to update the blue crab stock assessment as laid out in Amendment 3's adaptive management. So I'm going to start with the blue crab stock assessment. Um, so 
Um, we are building in adaptive management to our plans so that we can um, really address things uh, between plans if um, things occur. And as part of the um, Amendment 3 adaptive management, um, we included that we would update the stock assessment at least once between full reviews. The terminal year of the stock assessment was 2016, and it indicated that the stock was overfished and overfishing was occurring. The update will add six years of data, um, and depending on management type, that will be two to three years of data that has Amendment 3 management, which address the stock status. Um, another item the division is currently working on is um, the list of approved Diamondback Terrapin Biological Reduction Devices, or BIRDS. Um, these birds are required in Diamondback Terrapin management areas between March and October, um, and it, um, they need to be part of the approved list. Um, gear testing began in 2021 on a modified funnel design, which was proposed by North Carolina Crabbers. Um, the division is currently reviewing the results, and we will bring it to the Shellfish Crustacean Advisory Committee um, if we feel that the um, gear is appropriate to add to our list and that we need to modify that gear list. Um, so that will likely occur in early 2023. Things are looking positive. Mike. Um, not to interrupt you, but the no, this is good topic, sweet. <laughs> about the bird reviews, there is a Current proposal in the commercial fishing resource fund that allows an additional year of study. Mm -hmm. Just for the committee. We have approved that. I think we approved that one. I think, I think okay, so that one's moving forward for 2023. So we gave some monies to UNCW again uh, to to do additional year testing for a new crop catch reduction device for this terrapin. Um, so hopefully get some a clearer picture and uh, yeah, so I can update, update on that a little okay, bit. So you could add to that. I just yeah. To um and so this is something um that will actually um something that I discussed with Laura is having the folks from UNCW present to you all their findings. Um and so um one of this new study, the not new study, but they want to expand their study. Um, statewide. So the current study, the, there was one year in lab study um, to make sure that they, they put some terrapins in a tank, made sure that things were good enough to move to a field study. And then they worked with two crabbers um, and they did both within the diamondback terrapin management areas. And then they did outside of those areas as well. One of them being an area that's we'll call virgin kind of area. Um, it's a high terrapin area that no crabbing is allowed. It's in a Coast Guard channel. Um, and so we knew that there was a, a large population in there. Um, and so that's the study that they did that we are currently reviewing. And they want to now, since it had good results, they want to look statewide. So they're looking to partner with 10 Crabbers statewide um, and expand this. And what the design is, is it just takes the funnel of the pot and narrows it down. Um, so instead of it being 15 mesh, it narrows it down to 11 mesh at the mouth, and it then goes down to nine mesh at the entrance. Um, and so instead of having to put an additional device on the mouth, the funnel itself acts as the device. So that's kind of um, what the next step that, that they're looking for. And they're actually also looking at an economic um, piece of that as well. And they hadn't gotten those numbers yet. So I don't know about how the, ac ac the economic end of things is looking, um, but you don't have to buy an additional item and it's less mesh in the funnel. So 
to me that seems win-win. <laughs> so that kind of is my level of knowledge at the moment. Uh, Chair, if I might. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Uh, it's Doug Cross, if I could just uh, expand on that just a little bit for the new members. And maybe some of you don't really know why this came about. The our crab was red lighted by Monterey Bay and their seafood watch program several years ago, and it basically restricted sales to a lot of high end retailers that we were selling crab meat to at that time, and it's basically crippled the uh, crab meat picking industry, and therefore some of the crabbing in this state because basically we can't sell to a lot of retailers that are adhering to their program. Now, if any of you are keeping up with what's going on nationwide, they just red lighted the American lobster in Maine and they went ballistic. I mean, they've got senators and everything in the world that they're throwing at this uh, Monterey Bay crowd because they basically say they're not, um, uh, in violation of anything that would cause them to be red lighted. Well, we look back at what we weren't doing <clears throat> compared to some other states. And we specifically looked at Louisiana and Alabama because somehow they managed to stay yellow or green lighted on their scale. And the terrapin issue was the one of the larger issues that was uh, at the forefront of us being red lighted. So we started um, with a proposal and, and you're listening to the end of it now of trying to get these terrapin excluders in place and several other items that they needed us to do sanctuaries and stuff like that and we're there we're basically there and we need to just follow up with one more year to basically uh, make uh, all this data come together but you know this is something that we need to ram on through because it's absolutely crippled high-end retail sales of uh, crab meat, and it's caused the uh, crab to be depressed price-wise. And that's why this is one of the more vital pieces of the puzzle that we're trying to push forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ted Wilgus. Uh, along with the bird update will they, and the stock assessment, will also be somewhat of a, I guess, update on how the terrapin sanctuaries the management areas have I guess, worked in terms of the enforcement um, as well as how the terrapin, if there is any update on the terrapin populations within those areas. Just kind of, it's been a year, right? So, so you kind of see what's kind of gone mm -hmm. on in a year. Yeah, so um, we aren't the ones that do the terrapin right. work. That's um, WRC. Um, but I can say that um, additionally, since the terrapin um, terrapins have become more of a, a hot topic, um, WRC has actually expanded their terrapin tally. Um, so um, in the last two years, they have expanded from from I think they were doing like five areas initially. And now they're up to, I think, 12 areas that they're doing the terrapin count. And now they're actually going to expand again next year. And I think they had like 400 volunteers last year do the terrapin count. Um, and so um, we need to discuss with them on getting kind of, but that is something that they provide online annually is their terrapin tally. Um, they have a pretty flashy website for that. Um, and, um, but Carter might be able to discuss um, enforcement end of things. So for our enforcement, um, we have two areas right now. I can't quote the date and time that they closed because of the excluders that the population. But March 1 to October 31st. There you go. <laughs> um, we have extensive outreach with our crabbers that are in that area and it only it affected a lot but only a select few fished in certain areas so we we had great compliance in in that aspect for for the uh excluder um one of the one of the crabbers is you know that we we worked with um he's one of the ones that is you know manufacturing this tunnel to to so they have to put action advice on it 
your pot will be built ready to go instead of having to come back and stick an actual excluder on it. Um, hopefully, without the hopefully the new design um, allowing more crabbing, and so to say, ex except you know where the excluder might might lose it. And the um, a couple <clears throat> of the groups down there actually worked with the the crabbers in that area to get them um, the South Carolina device, which is one of the approved devices. Um, and they worked with somebody. They got them the specs on that and worked with somebody local to like three D print them um, at, because it was hard to find a manufacturer that makes a lot of these devices now too. So that's another benefit of this narrow tunnel is that these terrapin devices are actually kind of hard to find. And it, it's, you know, another piece of plastic you have to add on there. Um, we also have um, Jeff Fichenda, the biologist in Wilmington, that's done a lot of work um, on the terrapin issue. So if you're interested in talking more about uh, getting details and, and things like that, he's a great resource, um, and I'm happy to provide that. Yeah, thank you very much. Any other crab questions? I know we had one from earlier from Mr. Willis. He spoke briefly about the update, but did you give us a time frame on when that update was going to be? So it's going to be in 2023 um, as soon as 2022 data is available. Typically, April is when our data is completely available for use. Um, so once all of our 2020, 20, ugh, 2022 data is ready, um, we um, have our biologists already, you know, locked, locked and loaded with, uh, getting that data ready to go. And, um, then Yan would be running that model for us. Um, <clears throat> so best case scenario. Maybe the August meeting, yeah. July, August. <laughs> and by the way, Yan is one of our stock assessment oh, scientists. Have you? Uh, <laughs> we, we, are we still? I'm assuming we're still getting the cards and stuff from the crab houses. Have we seen the level in that? I know. I know the impact that Doug was mentioning. I've heard that from several of the. When I was down at the coast, I talked to some of the crabbers, and they've they've had that impact. I'm just curious about the biomass. Have you seen anything around that? I know we, it kind of went up. It was fluctuating up and down uh, from it, but no, no indications today. You, it was going to have to wait until next year. So um, we do look at all of our indices annually as part of our annual fisheries management plan review. So. Um, you can go on our um, website, and I believe Laura had provided this or will provide where our FMP annual updates are, yeah. and you can look at blue crab, and that has both the commercial and the rec or commercial and independent surveys, which would go into the stock assessment. The data from that is um, in those, okay. so you can see. Um, I looked, what you, I looked at six that years look like past that. Yeah, I looked a few months ago and it seemed to be older, so that was why I asked. And the same question on shrimp as well. Uh, from it, has there been any update on that? When is that happening? Or I'll, we can do that later, I assume. Um, what, what exactly are you asking about shrimp? When the biomass availability will be available to will that be at the around the same time? So shrimp is an annual crop. We don't do a stock assessment for that. Okay. Um, so shrimp is something that we look at annually. Okay. Good. And Mr. Mr. Willis, this is Laura. Um, I can send you the links to those documents so that um, you don't have to go search for them. That'd be great. Thank you. I'm a geek enough. I do read them and look at them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have we have about twenty six of them, I think. So. <laughs> That's good. And we put enough work into them. We appreciate somebody reads them. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I do. <laughs> good, and I appreciate it. 
anything else on crab. Doug, uh, you still had your hand up on the. <clears throat> still got a question. He took it down. Took it down. I took it down, but thank you. I'm <laughs> trying to keep up with you, bud. <laughs> All right, moving along. Okay, so returning to our FMP schedule, um, as Laura said, there was no management changes deemed necessary for river herring. Um, therefore, the August Marine Fisheries Commission meeting, the commission voted to adopt the 2022 annual FMP river herring uh, update as an information update to the plan. Um, and this will serve as the five-year review for that FMP. Um, the hard clam and oyster, hard, whew, hard clam and oyster. I can have words today. <laughs> um, that those plants um, have been opened up as of August. We are currently undergoing a review of the available data and current management in the state. Um, and you will likely hear more about this um, towards the later half of 2023. Um, we. We'll take a good amount of time to work on um, data and really assess the needs of the state um, before we bring it for scoping um, in late 2023. So the um, advisory committees gave, oh, sorry, moving on to estrogen striped bass. <laughs> The advisory committees gave recommendations for estrogen striped bass amendment two in March. And um, then the uh, Marine Fisheries Commission reviewed the amendment and completed um, their steps up to the point of um, adopting the plan. So at their November business meeting, um, they will discuss the amendment further and have the opportunity again to um, discuss adopting amendment two to the estrogen stripe bass plan. In the meantime, after continued stock concerns um, based on a low juvenile abundance, uh, which we um, looked at through our annual review, the division undertook a stock assessment update of the Albemarle and Roanoke stock. The division and Wildlife Resources Commission staff continue to work on this update. Due to an initial review of the assessment results, the director did not open the fall season for the Albemarle Sound, and the director continues to assess this subject. So next is our spotted sea trout. A uh, peer review panel agreed um, with the division that spotted sea trout assessment is the best available science and is appropriate to base management on. The assessment contains data through 2019 and estimates that the stock is not overfished with the biomass above the target. However, it is experiencing overfishing. Um, a stock assessment overview will be presented to the commission at its November meeting. How's that last thing? Yes, ma'am. It is not overfished. However, it is undergoing overfishing. So overfished means that there's not enough females in the spawning stock to produce enough fish to replenish. Overfishing means we're taking them out at a faster rate than the females can replenish. That's like two different terms for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, unfortunately, the terms are overfished and overfishing, uh, so it does get confusing. Um, so basically, um, it it means we just need to like you know ratchet back how much we're catching, um, or else we might end up in that overfish status possibly. Um, any other questions before I move on? Because the bulk of everything else is just going to be mullet. Anything on striped bass, oysters, or sea trout? Ted Wilgus, um, so when will this committee sort of see get an update on the oyster clam FMP in terms of that kind of scoping process? And when do we have input on that? So um, that will likely be towards the end of 2023. Um, we 
Um, so habitat enhancement and fisheries management are working. To, we work together on this plan. And um, so um, we're really doing a deep dive into the data we have and um, some possible management um, that habitat enhancement has in mind um, that we would like to really um, fully develop internally, like our thoughts on it before we bring it to um, advisories or the public or anybody, um, because we don't want to, we don't want to be like muddied or confused on what the, the bulk of that management would be. Um, so it's going to take a couple months for us to really bat that around. <laughs> Um, and so our, kind of right now, our thoughts are around this time next year would be when we really bring it out to the public and kind of get some more thoughts on on what the division has been thinking, kind of like what we're doing with mullet, where we, we get the stakeholders and the people that know a lot about it to give us kind of their point of view. Um, and then we will develop the amendment. Mm -hmm. Sue Hamilton, oyster farm. I'd like to know if there's any study going on about, um, I, don't know, I can't remember what it's called, this bird food mitigation on oyster cages. We had to make statements about what efforts we would make this year to avoid bird poo on our cages. My efforts aren't working out too well so far. So I'm wondering, is that something that's your requirement, is the requirement from fisheries? Is there a study there? I am not familiar on Ooh, go I'll ahead. Start. Yeah, go yeah. for it. I am, you, you are the go-to man today. So bird mitigation has come come out of the ISSC, which is the International Shellfish Sanitation Committee, which is regulated by the FDA. Not regulated by the FDA, but it's a partnership of all all the states and the FDA to come up with the molluscan shellfish regulation. Um, the bird mitigation came came out of a New Jersey study where they had to shut down a whole growing area because of bird feces into cages, and um, fecal coliform got too high in the water samples, so they had to shut down a whole. Um, growing area, which uh, raised the eyebrows of everybody in the ISSC to do some type of bird mitigation um, with the growing uh, use of aquaculture operation cages, long lines, bags. Uh, so that was put into effect through the ISSC. Um, we have all states have to follow basically follow the ISSC models and regulations. We go out of compliance with that, then you can't ship any shellfish out of state. We would be stuck with within with inside our state with that. Um, so right now the rule is we have that AOPs have, which an AOP is an agriculture operation permit. They have to have a bird mitigation plan in their AOP, and um, the ISSC committee has not finished all the regulations to say. What that plan has to do right now it just says that that farmers have to have a plan to mitigate bird species on their cages. So Carter, is that Shannon? Yes. That's Shannon and us. Okay, so Sh Shannon Jenkins is um, the head of our shellfish sanitation group. So um, he actually might be a really good resource if you're interested in talking about that more specifically. I just really like to know as, as a farmer, it's very hard to discover. So, it, you're, so the bird mitigation actually falls under the peer report for uh, harvest control, which is actually under the marine patrol. Um, but they have not put in the guidelines of what that has to be yet. Nobody has come out and said that your plan has to mitigate 50% of the birds sitting on your cages or or anything like that. That is that actually the ISSC meets March this March coming up 2023, and that will be on the agenda to talk about is what what the recommendation requirements are going to come out for farmers. Um, what it, you know what your plan is going to have to consist of, and 
and how it's going to work and you know does it mitigate birds from sitting on your cages That's I think my streamers are tracking them <laughs> 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 I, will, I will tell you the crowd in New Jersey is trying anything and everything. They're putting uh, whirly gigs on their on their cages. Um, right now, you just have to have a plan that specifies how you're going to mitigate. Talks to swim out there. And That's what that, <laughs> that might be the best case. <laughs> Thank you. Working on getting no, I, I, I couldn't hear y'all. Did you acknowledge me, Chairman? Chair? Absolutely. <laughs> I was uh, I was just I was just going to interject that the majority of these issues with the uh, bird interaction are occurring with surface equipment. Those of us that use bottom cages for almost exclusively, we're not having any issues with that, but I mean, I, it is a problem. I mean, they're, they're going to come down with something, but there are alternatives uh, if it gets to a worst case scenario. And um, something that I just want to clarify um, is that this new amendment for the um, Oyster uh, FMP will be um, focused just on wild harvest. Um, we were trying to um, not muddy the waters between the, the wild and the um, aquaculture um, because the aquaculture is becoming a large enough industry in itself. Um, so this amendment's just going to focus on wild harvest. We'll let shellfish sanitation deal with <laughs> their herbs. <laughs> Actually, bird, bird mitigation is through resource enhancement. Oh, and resource not, yeah. not, not Shannon's. It is. Okay. Okay. Res okay. Resource and it's, it's mandated through your AOP, okay. which is resource and hand. Okay. In the proposals, because I do proposal use reviews, they usually say, what's your bird mitigation plan? And we have to look at on. Zach, Zach is the AOP. Plan. Harrison is the AOP. And Owen is our lead children. I won't tell you his last name because I'll have him. I like this group. I'm learning things tonight. <laughs> okay, so um, the last uh, species I have to discuss is um, striped mullet. So our striped mullet stock assessment was presented to the commission at its May business meeting. The peer review assessment indicated that the stock is overfished and overfishing is occurring in the terminal year of 2019. Because of stock concerns, the DEQ secretary has determined it is in the long-term interest of the stock to develop temporary management through a supplement. The supplement will be in place until Amendment 2 is adopted. The supplement will be presented to the Marine Fisheries Commission at its November meeting. Also at the November meeting, the Commission will be asked to approve the goal and objectives for Amendment 2 and review the public scoping period, which was held from September 26th through October 7th. A scoping document was developed by staff to guide conversation and seek input on management strategies to be developed during the drafting of Amendment 2. Management strategies are techniques uh, to achieve the goal and objectives of a plan. The proposed management strategies for Amendment 2 include sustainable harvest, Recreational fisheries management, small mesh gill net management, stop net fisheries management, and migration corridors. The division reached out to stakeholders through a online questionnaire and three in-person meetings, one of which was held as a hybrid online meeting. Um, we are really trying to um, allow ease of access to um, as many of our diverse stakeholders 
um, as possible here in North Carolina. So we attempted this open forum meeting and attempted it hybrid. And I got a lot of input from um, people online on that. So I am always happy to hear of ways to increase this um, ease of access to our stakeholders. So I'm appreciative of those little things. Um, during the scoping period, over 200 stakeholders participated throughout the two weeks. Um, comments centered on concerns over the assessment results, regional management, gear specific management, year round fishing needs, recreational fisheries, and concerns on overfishing of different life stages, um, be it finger mullet or row mullet. Um, there was a lot of interest from stakeholders in being members of the Stripe Mullet Fisheries Management Plan Advisory Committee. Um, and so I look forward to speaking with those individuals who gave me either their email or phone number as we move forward with the process. That advisory committee works different than these advisory committees. Um, those, the FMP specific advisory committees. Uh, work with our plan development team in a workshop setting. We bring them the draft amendment and then they give us the like first look of stakeholders. We have um, fishers, we have scientists, um, we have at large people, um, anyone who is interested um, in being in those advisory committees that give the input of if management is possible, if we missed anything, if you know all of our I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Um, and we do that in a very shortened workshop setting. So just wanted to let you all know how that works. So when you said there were concerns over the assessment results, did people not trust the results or they were worried about what the findings were that they believed? So, one of the concerns is that the terminal year is um, 2019 and Jeff is here. He's one of our leads. Um, he may be able to speak better on this than myself. Um, but one of the concerns is that the terminal year is 2019. And since then we have really seen um, and anecdotally and in our sampling, we've seen an increase in um, striped mullet and so that's one of the concerns that we have heard from people um, and Jess can go a little bit more into detail. Yeah, and uh, beyond the terminal year concerns and the, the recent uptick in abundance, but we're just um, a little concerned with the previous assessments didn't show us as overfishing or overfished, although we were nearly overfishing. And we used the same model, but we changed the inputs a little bit. Um, every time we improve the model, it's going to change the outcome a little bit. So in those previous years, it showed that we were actually overfishing and the stock was overfished, even though the previous assessments didn't show that. So there was some concern about that discrepancy. We've gone over it quite a bit. Um, but we think right now we have the best available data. You know, we've we've improved the model and I think it's the most accurate model that we have. And um, as a division, we um, take our assessments very serious that we take them to a outside peer review panel um, so that um, these are uh, scientists who are outside of the division um, who have expertise in the modeling and in the species. Um, and we have a workshop with them. Um, the mullet workshop was over three days. Um, and. Yeah, <laughs> and um, so we sit down with them. Um, they are very knowledgeable and they make sure that what we've done passes um, muster and um, give us ways to improve it. Um, and so they work with our stock assessment biologists and our leads to really hone in that stock assessment so it's the the best available science that there is. Um, and both they at the end of that workshop and our management have agreed that it is what is sound science and the best available that we have now. I did want to note that, you know, they the peer review panel does bring us questions and concerns. We 
you do make uh, amendments and changes to the model to to address all of their concerns and to make sure that it's the most scientifically sound. So it did go over two different periods because they had some concerns. We addressed those, and they were kind of they were, they were, they were. and those are open to the public. Um, so as we have those, um, we put out press releases. To let people know when these document um, peer reviews are going on, so I mean they're pretty boring, but <laughs> everybody is will is um, you know allowed to join us and sit in and listen. Okay, it's not it's <laughs> not my cup of tea. <laughs> Doug, Doug, do you have something? Yes, thank you, Chair. The biggest concern I'm hearing from a lot of. Um, people, fishermen, and everybody else is that perhaps all the data uh, is not being used in this model that uh, and they're relating specifically to the shocking data. And uh, that's a big, I'm hearing a lot about that uh, on this particular plan. So I think it's something that y'all should be uh, ready to address when the time comes. Yeah, and I'd be happy to address that. Um, so the area that we had, the Previous, we have, we have expanded the survey since, but the previous survey that was used um, in the previous stock assessment, um, it was only in two areas, Slocum and Kahuki Creek or Hancock Creek in the Havelock area. So it was very limited spatially, um, and it wasn't a stratified frame design. They were fixed stations, but it overlapped with the Gillnet survey that we used as our primary fishery independent survey. So the overlap data, it was basically just repeating or showing the same trends. Um, so that lack of variability didn't really inform the model anymore. And it, we felt that we were, it was better represented by this stratified random survey that encompassed much more of the state than the, the shock survey did. Um, even in the previous assessment, we didn't use that upper, upper noose Bachelor Creek station because it just had such a low abundance. We weren't really able to track the abundance of mullet over the years. So we really only dropped the two station survey because it was already represented in the Gilnet survey. Um, and it was just sort of redundant. Um that was all I have. Um however um you know, since we've addressed the questions, if there's any input anybody has on um, management um, strategies, um, Jeff can kind of brief that. Yeah, so I know it's kind of hard to just off the cuff think of management strategies as it haven't already been discussed, but I think maybe as a primer, I can discuss what we've heard from the scoping meetings and, and from uh, the other ACs and it it's really that uh, folks to want uh, the ability to have adaptive management. We've heard time and time again, once you take away something, we don't get it back. Well, we'd like to build into this plan the ability where if the stock seems to improve, we could um, loosen the, the restrictions. Uh, and we've also heard that we, they don't want that, the public doesn't want that done through uh, landing data because landings are really, uh, the market fluctuations have a great effect on them. Uh, storms uh, kind of affect the availability of the fish. So it would be more uh, abundance index based, I, I believe. I also heard that this is not a one size fits all fishery. This is very regionally distinct. In the north, the, the bait fishery is much more important in this area. The row fishery is very important. And in the southern portion of the state, uh, folks are really selling meat fish to South Carolina. I've also heard that, you know, the southern part of the state doesn't see their larger fish until later in the year because there's that southern migration as the fish move out of the out to the ocean and move southward to, to spawn offshore. So we, we hear that it needs to be regional management. We've heard that we need adaptive management. Um, we've heard ideas like uh, gill net mesh size restrictions, whether it be a minimum size or a maximum to help reduce bycatch of these smaller fish that haven't spawned or to reduce the catch of these larger or fecund females to allow them to spawn. Um, 
we've heard discussions uh, about migration corridors protecting certain areas during certain times of the year to allow more escapement. I'm trying to address the first uh, gillnet uh, restriction or gillnet fishery issue that was brought by the MFC. They uh, decided that they weren't going to do any rulemaking, but they were going to refer that to each species. So if anyone has any input on user conflicts that they know of or other issues within gillnet fishery or a way that we could address sustainable harvest within the gillnet. Your guys, any ideas, concerns, comments, or even observations from the fishery that might help the division in selecting the most appropriate management strategy? I'd, I'd love to hear it. Any feedback you have? I got any ideas on what? That's what he's asking. And I understand that this is a shellfish crustacean, and it's sort of not a <laughs> lot of overlap, but we do want to allow every standing advisory committee to at least have the chance to, to get in. Go ahead, Doug. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you, Chair. I think there's some uh, factors that are going to be unique to the next uh, several assessments. Um, I can tell you right now, and I'm Mr. Tim, I'm going to tell you when you start looking at the the shrimp abundance reported this year, it's it's going to be so skewed because we had basically two weeks of just bumper crop production, uh, and it uh, was in the basically in the very area we threatened to close last year in the News River from about the ferry lines down to uh, Adams Creek and South River. And it lasted just about two weeks. The boats work, the sheer volume that they caught in those two weeks allowed them to work because the price was depressed because of massive production in the Gulf and the price of fuel. And the second of those factors, the price of fuel is going to have a completely skewing effect across every fishery that we've got going on now case in point we believe there was some there was shrimp in the sound all along but the the sound itself has been worked less this year overall by boats than it has in the last 20 because they cannot scratch along a trip because of fuel it just don't work the economics will not work so you've seen less effort over the entire summer and uh, you're seeing less effort now and you know there are some smaller uh, areas that uh, have some shrimp in them but the boats are still not working because the price is still depressed and fuel is over five dollars so when we go to looking at overall numbers comparing them to other years you know when you you're going to be very careful on your assessments and your information that you basically dole out of it to take these factors into effect because you're going to see numbers that just don't make any sense starting this year with several different species and shrimp's going to be one of them and, and fish it's just like the flounder trips now the summer flounder trips we've opened up a window between now and the end of december for 500 boxes and there's no mass exodus of boats going to get them because they're not going to bring enough money even if you get 400 boxes to overcome the fuel that you got to burn to get up there and get back. So when we don't fill our summer flounder quota this year, and oh, oh, we all don't care about it anymore. And no, it's not got anything to do about it like that. It's all simple economics, and the numbers just don't work. You can't ask a boat. I talked to a boat that left uh, New Bedford the other day. He'd used up his scallop days. He steamed straight home to Oriental, twelve thousand dollars in fuel, steaming straight home, no work. So you look at boats having to leave here, go up there and try to catch their box limit of fish and come back. You know, you're talking 24 grand minimum just running. Then you've got all that fuel that you're burning working. So when we start looking at a lot of these numbers in the future on a lot of these different species, it can't just be the nuts and bolts that we've looked at in the past. We're going to have to have a lot of uh, different factors figured in that we've had in a long time because we've never seen times like this where fuel is up to where it's at 
and you know the boats just can't go get it therefore it's going to reflect in the landings and you well they're way down well they're way down for a reason you know a lot of it had to do with lack of lack of uh enough product in one time to catch to be able to work on it because of fuel and a lot of it's got to do with that some of the areas just didn't have a product so when you go to modeling these things out you got to take a lot more factors uh, in the in the work than you have in the past i think thank you Thanks, Doug. Um, if I could just um, quickly provide some context for Doug's comments. Um, for those of you, since we are shellfish crustacean tonight, um, what he was referring to with the flounder fishery is the um, southern, or excuse me, summer flounder fishery, which is largely um, takes place off the mid Atlantic coast, and then they're landed here in North Carolina. Um, just for anybody who wasn't aware of that. Um, and Doug, just for you, um, and I know you know this, um, we do um, account for effort um, when we look at these things. Um, and I'm going to put a plug in. In November, you're going to receive the big book, which is, um, I forget the uh, official name of it, but it's basically um, our annual report that contains all of the data that we collect in all of our sampling programs um, for landings and uh, commercial and recreational landings data. Um, and so that's going to come out um, soon, but the commissioners will get it and it'll be part of the briefing materials for the November meeting. Um, it is available. It's done every year and it is available online. Um, it basically each uh, version of the document contains the 10 years of data. So it's a, a shifting timeline. Um, so you can actually go back in our archives and um, get pretty long time ago. I don't actually know when the first one is, but you can look at all of our data. Um, it doesn't provide any context for our data, but it does provide the actual data. And it's just called annual report? Um, it is the uh, annual, I think it's the annual landings and statistics report, but I will, um, I can forward that to you um, as a follow-up item as well. It's ready. I'll get you the various reports, fisheries statistics. That will take you to the science and statistics and the fisheries statistics. Down and still browse around with all kinds of other stuff. And I'll email you the link. I just wanted to clarify it's fisheries dependent data. Oh, just, thank you. It's yes. just the catch. Right. The survey we were talking about or the right. Survey. Yes. It's just fishery. Right. Data. And our um, that data is captured in our FMP update. Some yeah. of it. Oh, uh, species all specific. Of it. Um, species specific. In terms of the actual surveys themselves, some of them are grant funded. So the yearly grant reports are available, such as the Gilmet survey is under a CREPL grant. So we yeah. do have a yearly report that should be published. Yeah. Next month or two. Basically, if we collect it, you have access to it. <laughs> yes. Can you say, so if you read these four or five things, it would really be helpful to you? Well, I can send you, um, I'm going to send you the FMP updates. That provides basically a summary of all of our fisheries that we okay. update them annually. Okay. Um, that will give you sort of a good broad overview of each of our fisheries that we have FMPs for. Um, and then I'm also going to send you that annual report that, as he said, is our dependent data. Um, it, it does, it, it does provide some context, but it doesn't provide sort of the general analysis that the FMP updates provide for specific, for specific fisheries. Um, and so that will give you an idea of our data collection. Um, and there are some other documents that I can provide for you. Um, and I'm going to be putting those together um, in preparation for our January meeting as well for okay. additional new members who are going to be coming on. Yeah. That reading will take you a bit because <laughs> FMP annual book was, I think, 732 pages this last year. And the license and statistics big book was 531 pages. Is it on audio tape? <laughs> <laughs> we should have it on audio <laughs> <laughs> Listen while you work. 
we can all take a chapter and share. <laughs> <laughs> Got two points. So, are the, the options for the supplement to bring forward right at the two November meeting? Are they? So, I don't think we have the director's final final. We were still doing edits today. Okay. <laughs> so, no. I'm assuming because we don't have no documentation. Come on. That was an assumption that. Sure. Okay. And then just this is for my curiosity. Painting the bullet. Has there ever been a like an in depth tagging study done for white bullets? Yes, uh, in 19, I think I got the years wrong last time. It was conduct, it was the tagging was conducted from 98 to 2001, and we had returns all the way to 04, I believe. But uh, there was over 14,000 fish tagged in that time period over the entire range of habitats in the state from low salinity all the way to, I believe, there was some ocean tags put out. From the north and South Carolina border all the way up into Currituck Sound. Right. Um, and during the course of that tagging survey, uh, we, we determined that there was pretty high fidelity for fish within the state. There's only three that were captured outside of the state. So we're very confident to say that this is a North Carolina stock. They do go out into the ocean and they make a southward migration. They don't go into Florida, they go. They move south, they spawn, and then the eggs are dripped back up to us for recruitment, and the, the adults return into the inlets, typically back to the areas within 30 to 40 kilometers of where they were caught. You see them slightly in the same areas. The return tags. Yeah. Okay. What were the percent tags returned? Very low. <laughs> Very low. 14,000 tagged up, just under 400 returned. Um, and Three were returned from out of state, so you're looking at less than one percent of out of state. Returns. And why was that tag in the study discontinued or stopped or being funded? It was a grant project. And we have heard um, that that's another thing we've heard from the public repeated is that they would like to see a continuation of the tagging study. Okay. And that's something that could be addressed in the research needs within the plan. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, I think with Mullet, and then this is just my opinion, having lack of recreational anglers pursuing that species other than cast netters for you know, the, the juvenile, more, the more juvenile fishes, um, which would very much serve that, that species well to have persistent tagging study do, going on um, be very informative to see comparatively from that 98 to 01 study to now 20 years later what what evidence we could find of, of recapture and how much escapement we're seeing continual escapement which should inform that model well I do want to note that we're not the only state that's conducted tagging studies on mullet. It's it was done in the Gulf and on the, in Florida, and they the three other studies that I know of did conclude that uh, state level or small region management was appropriate because there wasn't a lot of migration between areas. Sure. Yeah. The migration I'm not as concerned about. Um, the, what the, the escapement is more of what I'm concerned about. And the recapture, because I think it informs what it would inform us of was the amount of recapture of those tags. You say there was 14,000 fish tagged and we only got 400 back. That's pretty low of, of recapture. And so whether they, you know, we don't know what happened to the rest of the 13,000 and a half fish, you know, but, you know, it could be predatory. They could be still in the system. 
Um, but it would be neat to see a, a, that that study come back because I think it would be absolutely valuable. Um, uh, Mike, can I? Absolutely. Um, in terms of tagging studies, how does that compare in terms of re return rate? You know, I don't, I, I can't speak to that right now. Um, when I was investigating the other studies, I was more just looking at support for statewide or with the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission. You have, you know, you have Alabama, Mississippi, and then you're all in small areas. So they were, a, they did regional management, but it's a, a small region. So, I was more comparing it for regional support for regional or state management. Yeah, I think uh, the reason I brought it up, I think that return rates for tagging studies are relatively low, but I don't know how low. Um, so just just to put that in perspective, it sounds like 1,400 out of 14,000 is insane, but um, that may actually be pretty typical. Just to give context for that, take a point. Three years ago, we tagged, I don't know, 15,000. I think we had about roughly 2%. So we're talking a high volume, a lot of fish being put out between Nova Scotia and North Carolina. And whenever you see rates above 5%, you're not doing I personally tagged 9,000 dogfish. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you. Is it the opinion that these fish that go off of uh, Florida and spawn that they are basically uh, resigned to come back to the Carolinas and the eastern seaboard of the United States? From what we know, that that's a different stock. So they're going out of the estuarine systems in Florida. Uh, you know the mid to north coast and then making their way down and we believe that the east coast stock of florida is distinct from the gulf coast stock. so um we might have some mixing between virginia and south carolina they don't really have much of a commercial fishery so um because of that i think north it's pretty safe to to manage north carolina as a single stock i don't think that there's a lot of mixing in florida i think the fish that they catch down there are coming out of their estuaries into the ocean and towards the southern part of Florida. Um, tagging studies have a return rate between two and ten percent. Okay, Doug, did Sorry. yeah, I was just uh, going to comment on that. Um, I don't want to blow anybody's mind, but if I was to tell you one of your tags ended up in Rio de, Rio de Grande, Brazil, in a mullet capture down there, what would you think then? I would think that there's always going to be a small contingent of migratory fish that move outside of normal regional boundaries. That's to be expected to have outliers like that. But um, we're, we can only base it on what the majority of the stock is. Um, if we had a really in-depth tagging study, we could get uh you know my like immigration and emigration estimates to try to figure out you know what percentage of the stock is might is be a migratory stock similar to striped bass you have a migratory stock you have a resident stock it's possible there's some small contingent that do move around but from what we can tell it's pretty small You know, some folks. We have some public comment. I don't think we have anybody from the public that now, right? Okay. All right. So, Brian, you got that was it for you, right? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Yeah, we got everything. You need. All right. Sorry. Thank you. So, no public comment. So, the next item we have is to plan items for our next meeting. Yep. <laughs> so, um, like I said, for um, when I talked about the 2023 schedule, um, we already have sort of tentatively planned for a stock assessment update. Uh, that is an overview of our stock assessment process, and it's an opportunity to talk to one of our um, stock assessment scientists, ask questions, and things like that. So, 
Um, that is the only um, thing currently on the schedule for January. Um, however, it will also um, be uh, an orientation um, time for new and also members who haven't been on long and certainly for this year um, haven't met very frequently. So in January, um, we are planning on a in virtual uh, meeting and it would be sort of um, similar to this. It will have updates from the November meeting. We'll have that presentation and then some orientation materials um, and suit specifically to what you asked for. Um, we uh, updated the MFC orientation. We've been working on that and um, we're also going to update this uh, advisory committee orientation as well. Yep. So, um, so I will be um, in touch with you. If there's anything specifically that any member would like to request to hear um, or talk about with the group, we can certainly do that. And if anyone has anything after the meeting they'd like to hear about or talk about, we can certainly talk about it after as well. Um, I'd like to have one idea just to get the brains in this direction. So, um, we're going to get a blue crab update sometime next year. And maybe in January would possibly be a good idea since we have a light agenda so far mm -hmm. to possibly look at the adaptive management management in the blue crab FMP mm -hmm. just so they would just sort of get an overview of it. Overview yep. of what the adaptive management strategies are going to look like. Oh, just to get them familiar with what's in there um, and sort of what's going to happen if we do take up do some adaptive management. Mm -hmm. That would be one idea. Would you like that to include kind of an overview of what the stock assessment data Sure. It, just an overview of crab. You know, we got high level crab. Yeah, that and the and down into the adaptive management portion. Mm -hmm. You know what what we're going to look at doing. What what the strategies could be. Mm -hmm. uh, that way, they'd be pre familiar with what was coming at them. Yeah, and absolutely. Not just kind of all at one time. Yep. That's still the stoplight program. No, we changed. That's gone. Yeah. Did, we did a stock assessment. <laughs> it's a sex based stock assessment and it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe if I could continue. But the Monterey Bay is a concern. And the fact that they sort of do things unannounced, I mm -hmm. think, is the best way to put it. Um, and it would be nice to learn, sort of learn a little more about Monterey Bay's list, mm -hmm. how to delist yourself. So I can do that. <laughs> I mean, really, because I, 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 have, I have yet to understand yeah. this. We have put things in place. Um, lobster industry in Maine has has done quite a bit to try to mitigate things. They've done a lot of research and they still get put on these lists. So I'm just trying to help us all understand. Mm -hmm. Yep, I looked into it um, after the blue crab plan was adopted um, and, and certainly Commissioner Cross had some uh, questions about it. So I can provide that update, just sort of an overview of what the program is. And also um, there are ways for um, just citizens to basically submit uh, uh, requests for um, review or things like that that can actually influence that okay, system. So so that at, 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 I can do that in January. Yeah. Doug, did you have anything you wanted to? Have yeah, to I can tell you how to influence them real quick. Send them money. That's basically <laughs> what the whole program revolves around. He who contributes gets their way. There's no rhyme or reason to what they do half the time on these listings. Ask, ask the people in Maine. I mean, I'm not, I'm not being funny with it. I'm being truthful. 
you go back and you look at the donors that's involved in this program, that's that's what it's 95% about, it's money, unfortunately. I mean, some of it's about a resource, but most of it's about money. But they do influence places highly. So you probably need to be familiar with that. And, and Doug, if, if you, I'm sitting here reading some notes from our, our meeting uh, and you wanted to discuss some housekeeping issues uh, what the procedures requirements for shellfish leases? You want to speak yeah. on that? Any? Um, yeah, I, I talked with Zachary. I talked. Uh, we've got another meeting coming up, and they've already implemented uh, some changes. They uh, have made the renewal process of the AOP very much more uh, streamlined. They've actually uh, taken some recommendations, and they. Uh, will basically give they're sending you last year's um, paperwork and if you don't have any changes all you got to do is check it sign it and send it back which was a brilliant move instead of having to do the whole packet over again so they are um, doing some changes as we go Zach and them are trying to streamline it more and more uh, I think there's some issues that we're going to talk about that perhaps are um, redundant on some of these AOPs that they overlap each other. Maybe we don't need so many AOPs to handle some of these operations, but we'll discuss that. Um, and um, so there there are some uh, clerical and housekeeping things. We've got another meeting coming up. We're going to talk a lot about these and see what comes out of it, but they are trying to streamline this and make it easier on the growers. And I commend them for that and uh, make it easier on everybody because it's it, it, it started out kind of low level paperwork and it's increased ever since to it's got to where you, you got to have a almost a phd to keep up with all this stuff so they are trying to streamline it they've done a good job so far and i think they'll continue to do that based on uh some of the meetings that perhaps we have coming up thank you so the, just a final question to you about it is there anything you feel like this committee needs to talk about um no i would say we I'd say let's put it off to the next meeting because uh, we're going to have a few more discussions on maybe streamlining some of this stuff and uh, maybe it all get handled uh, pretty easily. And then we can come back and tell y'all what we've done uh, in those discussions okay. and go from there. Or did you have anything you want to add? Yep. So, Doug, um, the uh, under the director's report at the November meeting, the um, Actually, I think it's Jacob Boyd. No, it's Owen is going to be um, presenting uh, an update on the shellfish uh, shellfish lease program. And part of that, he's going to talk about that. Um, he's also going to be developing um, more information about that for your February meeting specifically, because there are, as you said, there are other changes that are going to be um, moving forward in that program. So um, I know you'll get an update on it in November and then you'll hear more um, complete information in February. And so that'll be part of my update um, at your January meeting. It'll sort of be an update on that program. Thank you. Any Anybody else got anything they would like or think this committee should take up in the meantime while we're waiting on some work, waiting on some tasks and waiting on some votes? <laughs> Ted Logus, um, but the stock assessment, I know the division is working with NC State on the oyster stock assessment, but um, if it's possible just to get an update on kind of where they are, with the methodology and kind of moving along as part of that stock system update, just so we know kind of what, what's happening and what they're learning so far, that would be helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So just to clarify on that, what we're working on is not a stock assessment. It is the uh, methodologies of doing a survey, which then 10 years or more from now would lead to an assessment. So I just, uh, we, the community in general keeps referring to it as working on a stock assessment. Right. And, and so we've seen some confusion happening there. Um, yeah. So we just wanna make sure people are aware that it's the survey methodologies that we're working on, which then could lead to an assessment. So an update would probably be really good. Be yeah, that, kind of, <laughs> that language yes. and timeline and know that. Yes. You know, yeah, absolutely. Joe can do that yeah. for you. Okay. 
what Dan has gotten into to the extent that the subtitle was in Kim for sale. He also established that they did title, but it's not all state. So it is very restricted to some smaller regions that can pay. So it's time to tell. Right. But he had some really cool graphics. <laughs> yeah. Idea. Anybody else got anything? Anybody online? Hands raised. And and just as a reminder, um, I'm available um, to all of you anytime. Uh, if you come up with anything after the meeting, feel free to reach out. Alrighty, seeing as nobody has anything else, I'm make a motion to adjourn. There it is. Thank you guys. Bye. 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 <laughs> Thank you. He didn't wait for the vote. He was just done. <laughs> <laughs>